Welcome, I'm Dr. Lowry Barnes. We're so glad you joined us tonight for tonight's masterclass. Tonight, we're gonna have a discussion about mechanical alignment, kinematic alignment, both restricted and unrestricted. And we want to really express our thanks to Microport Orthopedics for hosting this event. The company is well known for its medial pivot approach to knee replacement. My background is that I am a, was a designer of the Evolution knee, the current medial pivot knee. The, the predecessor knee was the advanced knee, the medial pivot knee for Wright Medical that became my, Microport Orthopedics, and then the Evolution knee. This knee has um, had a long history of great results using standard mechanical alignment. So it's gonna be very interesting tonight to hear from these two experts on why they moved to kinematic alignment, why it works well for this knee, and what we all can learn from them about the, not only the knee replacement, but different alignment techniques to place this knee. We have two experts with us tonight. Dr. Robert Stinson practices in Columbus, Ohio. He's a member of the Orthopedic One Group, the largest physician group in um, Ohio. And he has a large experience with kinematic alignment, and we look forward to hearing from him, to, from him tonight. Dr. Pierre Indelli, now in California at Stanford, moved there from Italy, in Florence, Italy, and um, Professor has lots of experience in hip and knee replacement. Tonight, he's going to talk to us about unrestricted kinematic alignment and, and what that brings to his patients. So I think we are going to be spoiled rotten tonight with two experts sharing their thoughts. We look forward to that, and our first speaker tonight will be Dr. Bob Steenson. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barnes. I'm always happy to talk about knee replacement, and I have a special interest in kinematic alignment. Uh, I, liked, I, I have some slides I'd like to share to stimulate some of our discussion. I, I, um, you'll see later in the slides why I call uh, combining medial pivot with kinematic alignment as the most natural total knee. Uh, I think this was a landmark article for me. Uh, it was in 20, 2005 by Dr. Eckhoff, and what he did was he found that a cylinder was a best fit model for the shape of the distal condyles. Now, this is very helpful for uh, those companies that are single radius design knees, and the medial pivot is a single radius design, even though it's a very specialized subset of a single radius design. But uh, this, to me, is we'll come back to this as to why I think this is important in kinematic alignment. Uh, I wanted to just touch up, touch my uh, viewpoints on the medial pivot knee. It, it is the most stable uh, knee. It's more stable than a cruciate retaining. It's more uh, stable than a posterior stabilized. These are two studies where the authors use the KT-1000. That's a, if you're a sports medicine physician, you're familiar with that as a device that straps on the front of the knee to test how loose the ACL is. And uh, in these two series, they found that uh, of the primary total knees, the medial pivot was the most uh, stable. So uh, I, I think that's a big plus. Uh, again, being a single radius knee, it can be designed as a ball and socket on the medial side. And uh, this is distinguished from some multi-radius or J-curve knees where um, even if they, if they make the polyethylene more congruent, it can't be more congruent in flexion as the decreasing radius of curve occurs. So this is where the ball and socket stability gives you stability throughout the range of motion. Uh, this is one of my favorite studies. Dr. Pritchett's a wonderful person and, and I think he's also kind of a brave surgeon because most times if we've done a total knee on a patient and they're happy with it, we're very tempted to do the same implant and the same technique. Well, he purposefully did a different implant to see which patients preferred. So uh, if somebody got a PS knee on one side and a CR knee on the other, he would ask the patient to compare. Well, there were four different groups, uh, the CR and the PS, and then the medial pivot was there, as well as the bicruciate retaining. And when you looked at the medial pivot knee compared to cruciate retaining or PS, and these are patients comparing their own knees one against the other, the patients who had a medial pivot preferred the medial pivot knee three to one over the cruciate retaining or posterior stabilized. So I think there's a lot of power when you ask the patient themselves, which knee do you like better? And uh, this was uh, to me a, a very telling sign. And I think there's a lot of strength in an approach like that. So 
I, I think that too, the idea of the stability is what uh, I think the patients like because CR knees, you have to balance the posterior cruciate just right. And sometimes that works well, or sometimes maybe not. And the posterior stabilized knee can be stable in certain arcs of motion, but it's not stable. Uh, the mechanism doesn't engage through the whole arc of motion like the ball and socket design is engaged through the whole arc of motion. So uh, this is uh, condensed a little vertically, but this is also from Dr. Eckhoff's article. And what he was demonstrating here is that the yellow line, uh, which is marked as the transepicondylar axis, has been a common, um, common axis referred to in mechanical alignment. And if you look at the cylindrical axis, that was the, the green. He had that red cylinder we showed a couple slides ago. The center of that cylinder is the green line which we mark as the axis of the cylinder. The, uh, this is shown in extension and it's shown in flexion and you can see they are not the same. So uh, the cylind cylindrical axis is actually gonna go off of the joint surface. So that's in my mind, this is a very important thing because this is what the tibia, the tibia rotates around the femur, the tibia rotates around the femoral surface. So what I've done is I've taken his concept of a cylinder and stuck the cylinders onto their respective axes. For a KA knee, we try to duplicate the surface of the joint, which duplicates the cylinder, which should then duplicate the axis of the cylinder. So this shows these in flexion and in extension. If you follow the transepicondylar axis, you can see that it, it follows the yellow line there. And you can see you're elevating the joint line somewhat on the medial side both in extension, so that would be your distal femoral cut, and in flexion. And, and people commonly say, well, I externally rotate three degrees, but in that sense, you might be elevating the, the uh, postromedial joint. So again, this is slightly condensed, but I, uh, I consider the femoral surface and the ligaments as a functional unit because the tibia rotates around the femur, the patella actually does too, but the tibia rotates around the femur if it's a cylindrical axis. And if the ligaments are, we use the ligaments, if we match that surface, then the ligaments will sense this as a normal, a more normal knee. If you don't match that surface, the ligaments, which of course attach to the femur, are gonna sense this is not quite natural. So this is part of why I feel this is trying to mimic the natural uh, anatomy of the patient's knee. So how does one do this? Well, there are many different uh, options available. This is one that uh, we worked with Microport on where instead of traditional uh, manual instruments for mechanical alignment, which have some limitations, uh, we have some great flexibility with this. This is a femoral guide that will allow you to dial in your uh, adjustment for wear on either condyle or you know one or the other or both. It'll tell you what angle it is. So you have the ability to, uh, as you see with the blue arrow there, if there was two millimeters of wear as there commonly is, you can dial out that side for two millimeters and then your resection is gonna take account for the two millimeters of wear. So if you're trying to duplicate the pre-wear femoral surface, this allows you to do that. We also, this is a very cursory look at things. We have a cartilage thickness gauge so you can measure the amount of cartilage and, est and extrapolate the cartilage loss. So uh, this allows you to dial in the angle. Be because there's an angle there, you, too, you can override if you wish. If you say, I don't feel comfortable with this angle of the distal femoral cut, you can dial that to a different uh, degree if you wish. So it, it gives you, it, it's kind of a data-driven data -driven procedure, even though it's not high tech. It tells you how much you're resecting medial, how much you're resecting lateral, and what your angle is. So uh, instead of doing all the cuts and then balancing the, essentially, with this technique, you balance the knee after you've restored the femoral joint surface where you believe it was pre-arthritis. You've restored that surface. So now you're gonna see, what do I have to do to balance the knee to, to make the ligaments work? And this is where if we treat the femoral surface and the ligaments as a functional unit, then that's gonna help determine the tibial cut. So again, this is a common example where this is a varus knee. We have a spoon or a thickness gauge there where we can measure, for instance, if it's three millimeters to balance this knee, then we know if we're putting in a 10 thick implant on this side, the medial side will cut seven because we already have 10 of gap. And then we'll, we'll cut 10 on the lateral side and that should balance this knee. 
So in the diagram, you see two spoons. Sometimes you use two spoons, but most of these are uh, straightforward varus knees or valgus knees. So often you use just one spoon. Uh, how do you uh, cut the tibia? Well, this is an interesting tool. It looks a little uh, complicated, but it's actually extremely simple. It has two styluses and it has an angle guide and each stylus is independently uh, adjustable. So for instance, if we wanted to resect seven on the medial side, we can set for a seven resection on the medial side. If we want a 10 resection laterally, we can set it for 10. We can let the stylus settle onto the plateau and then we can measure the angle. We can unlock the angle and then we can see where it is. And if we're happy with this, we can accept it and lock it and pin, the, pin it and make our cuts. If we wanna override this because we're unhappy with the angle, then we can um, override if we wish. Again, you have data, you have how much I'm gonna resect medial, how much I'm gonna resect lateral and what's my angle. And again, you still have posterior slope control like you typically do. So what's the value of medial pivot and kinematic? I, I think there's great value to medial pivot I personally think there's value to kinematic as well. Why do I feel that way? Well, the medial pivot knee, I think, tries to duplicate the longitudinal axis of the, the longitudinal rotational axis of the knee. And kinematic tries to duplicate the flexion and extension axis of the knee by duplicating the femoral surfaces prearthritis. Now, if you combine the two, then you're matching the two axes about which the knee moves. So I think that this is gonna feel quite natural to the patient because you're trying to duplicate the natural natural motion of the knee. Um, many times uh, total joint surgeons and patients will and therapists will all say well hips do better than knees and uh, I think that's the common experience and I think there may be an explanation or a partial explanation for this. A hip is um, typically when you ream the acetabulum and put the, the, the hip in it's gonna be pretty close to the axes of flexion and rotation of, of the native hip. It's gonna be pretty close just by the nature of the procedure and the nature of the anatomy. For the knee, if you can match the medial pivot idea and you can measure, match the flexion extension, I think that that's gonna feel more natural to the patient for the same reasons. You know, if you're, if, you're, uh, if you're going straight down the center of the knee and you're having a central rotating femur, and if you have a, a, an unnatural flexion extension axis, I think the patient may perceive that as not quite natural. And I think that's because the ligaments are not under um, normal tension. You, either they're, they're, they may be closed or you may have had to release some ligaments, but um, uh, that's why I favor this technique. And this is why I think medial pivot and kinematic are synergistic in trying to achieve this. Some people are very nervous about how x-rays look and I did mechanical alignment for years and years. And um, so when I first started doing some kinematic knees, you'd say, look at that tibia, it's in a little bit of varus. This is a very common clinical appearance for me. And uh, now I don't look at it and feel that it's bad. I look at it and I feel like it's good. And uh, this is kind of an average one. Some of them are a little more varus, some of them are a little more valgus, but I think that, um, I think that this is an exciting topic and I'm interested to hear what others say and uh, the, the number of articles coming out on this are growing and growing. And so I, I think it's very interesting. And in my clinical experience, my patients um, are doing better than they did before I did medial pivot. I think when I switched to medial pivot, I had a noticeable improvement in their results. And I think that's due to the stability of the knee. And then when I switched to kinematic, I think I even got another increase in my results because uh, my patients are coming in and they're regaining their motion so quickly because I think they're not fighting their ligaments at all. They're just, um, they're, they're very pleased. I'm getting people who've had their other knee done by other surgeons coming to my office saying, you did so-and-so's knee and they, did, they got better a lot quicker. Can you do my knee? So I think that's a good testament. So I I'm convinced, but I think more and more literature is coming out. And I'm, I think there's certainly room for a lot more research to come out too. For instance, uh, I'm very interested in to know what, the, what are the limits. I, I'm relatively unrestricted for a varus knee. For a valgus knee, I'll, I'll trim it in a little bit. I don't wanna be too valgus. So, but that's just my personal thought and, and others may be more unrestricted. 
and others may be more restricted. And I think that's kind of a whole frontier that would be very nice to see where that goes. Bob, thanks for that great discussion. Um, great presentation. You brought up a lot of great points about the medial pivot knee and also about uh, alignment techniques. And I think it'd be great for us to just discuss those. You've laid the groundwork for it. Professor, why don't you tell us how you started moving to the medial pivot knee and the kinematic alignment? Did you, how you got to the medial pivot, if it came first, or, and then how you got to kinematic alignment, or if the two were reversed, how you got to KA and then got to, to uh, medial pivot? Thank you, Laurie. Those are great questions. So I want to share with you a little bit of my, you know, previous experience. Uh, in the early 2000s, I was a postdoc at Stanford, and I worked in Tom Andreaki's gate lab. So we studied several total knee designs at that time, but the medial pivot knees are the closest to normal kinematics. I was a young surgeon, a young student, and I was impressed about that. So I started using mainly medial pivot uh, designs in my practice in 2012, something like that. And uh, I did not change since. Uh, right now I'm using uh, both pure ball and socket design like evolution and, and uh, Robert show differences in design there. And uh, also medially congruent, medially stabilized, some hybrid solutions. So I still study my uh, medial pivot uh, patient's gait and they keep showing uh, closer to normal kinematics when compared to posterior stabilized and CR knees. So many of my patients, the same way that uh, Robert say, are extremely active and happy. And uh, they are able also to perform some low impact sports. I think we have this, the same back, uh, um, you know, background and uh, the same patients to give us the same feedback. So I'm pretty happy with that. And, you know, I'm European, as you know, and uh, so it's like uh, the kinematic alignment concept. Probably, can I say that start in Europe a few years ago? And that's the reason that I, I got uh, interested in. So, so you started as a, as a new surgeon, you started with a medial pivot design. You never went from a CR PS to medial pivot. So originally, the first, uh, uh, you know, I did my fellowship at Duke in 2006, so with Ted Bell. So I started using PS at that time, but as soon as I was in practice, I started with medial pivot. And, uh, and I went to practice in Europe first before coming back to the U.S. And I, I started in Europe with a ball and socket design, different company from Microport, an European company, which is Medacta, but the same concept, right? Fully ball and socket. And, uh, and I was very happy. And about the beginning, you know, I was a little bit worried about the stability. And uh, Robert discussed about this. You know, when you come from PSNE, you, you are in a safe zone, right? In a safe environment. And I was a little bit worried about my mid flexion and flexion instability. So I, I, the first few knees were a little bit tight in flexion. I was worried about that. I was very worried about my tibia slope. I was worried about instability. And then I got used to that. And I think this is a good point from new surgeons. I, I start opening a little bit my flexion gap, right? Increasing my tibia slope and my patients did better. They had better range of motion. And, that, and then the way that brought me to stay with, the, with, this, uh, with this technique. And KA, KA comes from Europe and I, I, I do both ways. Uh, I started with that restricted way, with the same company, with the same instrumentation. And, uh, you know, I'm getting older a little bit. I don't like that much those, you know, extremely various or valgus alignment in my post-op x-rays. So I stay inside boundaries. So right now I'm doing a formal restricted kinematic alignment, and we can talk about that later. Great. Well, since, since you mentioned Tad Vell, I have to tell you my experience and how I got to the medial pivot knee. Uh, Tad and I have been friends since um, my fellowship in Boston when I was learning to be a cruciate retaining knee surgeon. Tad visited there on his traveling fellowship. We've been friends ever since. I was actually with him just a few weeks ago in San Francisco. But um, I started out with initially using the right medical hips. And I was going to all these meetings and speaking and I kept having, hearing Dave Blaha talk about the medial pivot knee but he kept talking so far over my head, I didn't really get the concept. And so, but after a while, it kind of started, it made a lot of sense. And so being a cruciate retaining surgeon, I started with the, what was called the uh, double high insert at the time from the advanced system and you retained the PCL and you could release it some to balance it, et cetera. And so I was doing that routinely. And then 
I, I had lots of surgeon visitors, one of which was Tad Vail. And I said, so I said, Tad, you still doing post-stab knees? And uh, he was. And so that day, I said, okay, I'll take out the poster cruciate today and put in a medial pivot insert. And so I did it that day. And then for, I don't know, a number of months, every time I had a post-stab surgeon visit, I'd take out the PCL and put the medial pivot insert in instead of the double high. It didn't take long to realize that my medial pivot patients were doing better, getting their motion faster, and were happier. So, so Tad Vail has helped me get there too for different reasons. So, um, Bob, what about you? How did you start? Um, did you tra what did you transition from to get to a medial pivot design? And what about your um, to get to the kinematic alignment? I think you said you you got the medial pivot first and then um, KA, but yes. what did you leave to get there? Uh, I was using a conventional CR knee and doing mechanical alignment, and I'd done, you know, I've been around for a while, so I've done six or seven different knees, but um, I, when kinematic articles first started appearing, I thought, well, this isn't what I was taught. This doesn't seem proper, uh, and yet when they kept appearing, I kept thinking about it. Well, it, it does kind of make some sense to me, and um I'm kind of a comprehensive knee surgeon. I don't do hips, but I do a lot of other knee work, a lot of sports knee work and ligament knee work. And so the ligament isometry and all those things were making some sense to me. And so when I realized that the kinematic alignment was going to mimic the native flexion extension axis, I thought, well, this, this would be a natural uh, thing to, to mate with a medial pivot knee. So there, I was looking around and there weren't really good instruments to do a kinematic alignment uh, when the time I was interested in it. And I was trying to be cost conscious and not get um, patient specific instruments on every patient and CAT scans and all that. So uh, I did work with Microport and they helped develop these instruments, which I think I, I call it kind of PSI in real time, you know? So I have data right at my fingertips and I can adjust anything I want during the middle of the case. And so I, um, I did the medial pivot first and there was definitely uh, an improvement in the patients, I think because of the stability and, uh, and they were doing very, very well. But then I had the bug to try to try the kinematic. And then I think those patients to me seem to get flexion better and faster. And um, sometimes I've actually had to instruct my therapist don't push the flexion on the patients because they seem to get it so quickly that I'm concerned that my medial retinacular repair, you know, I have to let that heal a little bit before they, sometimes they come in the office on the first visit at two weeks and they're zero to 120. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, don't, don't stretch that apart. So um, it's been a, a good change for me. And I think patients are, are very satisfied. It is, it's a subtle thing. It's a 3D thing. It's not just in the coronal plane. It's a subtle thing with rotation and even with AP positioning because kinematic alignment is always going to be posterior referencing uh, when you do, and we usually do a zero degree external rotation, uh, again, because we're trying to match uh, the native anatomy. So for me, that first slide I showed with the cylinder that Dr. Eckhoff described, Everything I'm thinking during the case is I want to match that cylinder. I want to match that cylinder. I want to match that cylinder. If I match that cylinder, then the ligaments are going to feel like that's where it should be. So it was it was gradual over time, but each time I think I've I've noticed an improvement in my patient's outcomes. Great. Well, it's impressive too that you uh, give reference to Dr. Eckhoff and uh, his contribution because um, it's uh, it was some classic work that he did that was. Uh, not understood by many at the time it was presented. And now more and more people are starting to understand the cylindrical axis of, of which he spoke. So, um, so Professor, you said that now you are more uh, limiting in how far you go with your cuts. Why don't you describe that for us? And then we'll go back to Bob and see how just how far he'll go, what it means to be unlimited. So yes, as I told you, I started using uh, KA in 2010 or, or so when I was still practicing in, in Europe. I'm Italian-American, so I've been back and forth all my life. Uh, so so uh, I started talking to my European colleagues, uh, Jay Bellemans and the Belgium group, and they were enthusiastic about this KA, right? 
So uh, I start uh, unrestricted, as I told you, then I decide to be a little bit more limited. I, as I told you, I was not happy to see those post-op uh, X-ray with, you know, seven degrees, eight degrees of virus, of virus, it was a little bit too much. I was a little bit worried about, and we know about early loosening, right? When we are outside from that five degrees safe zone, we put a risk our implants. There is a two, three, four, five times higher risk of a, a, a early loosening, especially of the tibial components, but also the femoral components. There is literature about that. So I, I decide that, you know, staying at three to five degrees uh, uh, zone, safe zone was the best way for me, but I need technology to do that because uh, I love Bob instrumentations and I use it, but you know, now we have technology and we can get some help to technology to stay in those boundaries. So right now I'm using robotics in 80, 85% of my cases, uh, I, I do robotics. So I, I set my cuts, the distal cut, I wanna stay within three degrees of the distal lateral femoral uh, angle, which is the mechanical uh, axis of the femur. I wanna stay around three degrees, uh, two to three degrees uh, uh, inside the medial, people, uh, medial proximal tibial angle, which is the uh, mechanical axis of, of the tibia. So I set preoperatively in my software and intraoperatively with my soft, the software, I set the boundaries. And, and as you know, with robotics, you can only check during your uh, phases where you are with your HKA. So that's the way I do it. Uh, I like to start from the flexion gap and I maybe do something a little bit different from you guys because I like to establish my flexion gap first with, with my, you know, intraoperatively in, with my uh, software. And I like to be a little bit tighter medially. Uh, Laurie, I don't know if you like that, but uh, I, I'm changing a little bit from the dogma of symmetric uh, gap balancing. I don't think that we should completely symmet symmetric medially laterally. I think that you sh we should be a little bit tighter medially and the design, right? The design will help you uh, even more to get a little bit tighter medially, but that's my approach. And then I go to the extension gap. And again, I wanna be a little bit tighter medially there too. And then I check, I check my a HKA, but uh, I like to start from the flexion gap. So I don't know your, your opinion on this, but uh, I think we have an opportunity here, especially with, with Skywalker and the new te robotic technology to be very precise with those cuts and very right. precise with that intercompartmental uh, gap difference. Yeah, that's that's great. You and I uh, get to the similar, close to similar place as far as our balancing by different techniques. I'm still mechanical alignment, but I agree with you that in my hands, I don't want the inflection, the gaps to be the same because I think um, that's not how our knee works either. Um, Bob, what about you? Your, your technique, um, you, on a, for a varus knee, do you have a limit on how far, how much uh, varus I, cut I, have, I have, I haven't encountered a, a limit yet. I probably would have one because I don't want to be ridiculous. But um, I think that because the native, you know, we talk about constitutional varus, I think a knee tolerates varus better. Um, I see, you know, varus knees can wear down and wear down, but they very rarely stretch out the lateral ligaments. Whereas I, the main thing I look at at a valgus knee is I actually look at the medial side because if the medial side is wide, I'm thinking to myself, this is not a kinematic case because in kinematic, the technique I use, I need those ligaments to be uh, semi-normal to tension to find the right cut or find the right balance. So if, if the MCL in the valgus knee seems attenuated, I'm thinking this is a knee that's not a kinematic case. This is either a mechanical case or this is a uh, even a constrained case. But uh, in valgus, I'll, I'll limit it somewhat, but even these instruments allow me to do something slightly different than mechanical alignment, even though my end result may be close to mechanical alignment. I, I call it a medial joint line preserving procedure. So again, I'm trying to, that the intersection of the rotational axis and the, long, and the flexion extension axis in the medial femoral condyle, I, I still wanna respect that. So if there's a, a valgus knee that I think it's too far valgus, I'm not going to, to accept that. Um, I'll still try to match the native anatomy on the medial condyle distally and posteriorly, and then I'll rein in the changes on the lateral side. Um, 
And I, I've been very happy with that. I had a, a, a couple ladies who are valgus knees and I did valgus knees and they did great and the x-rays look fine. But they said, but I thought it would look straighter. And so um, sometimes there's even a cosmetic element to what we do. And so I, uh, I'm relatively unrestricted. I think the difference between unrestricted and restricted surgeons is actually very small because if you throw out the whole bell-shaped curve of all the knees that come out, you're talking about probably 5% or less. So an unrestricted and a restricted guy are going to do the same case probably 95% of the time. It's just the extreme ends where they would change. And I think that's where that's where ongoing research would, you know, help everyone help me to say, well, should I rein that in a little bit or is it okay to let, let it go at that? And uh, I, I'm, I'm rel I try to be relatively conservative because I don't want to be way out there. But uh, I think that the idea of these instruments was it gave you an idea of the angle so that you would have a little bit of um, control over that. So now right. I agree wholeheartedly that the, uh, the gaps shouldn't, be, they should be asymmetric. I mean, I, this technique that I just showed, we just balance the knee in extension only because I want a stable knee in extension. We match the posterior condyle anatomy on the femur. And so that's just gonna go where that goes. Now, uh, all of us who've trained, you know, done arthroscopy in the past, we know that the knee is tighter in extension. And when you wanna look in the lateral compartment of the knee, what do you do? Well, you flex it and you put it in that figure of four position. And then all of a sudden, gosh, you can see right through the knee laterally. So the natural knee has a wider flexion gap laterally. So by matching the anatomy posterior, so we get that we get that gap. Now, no one ever complains to me that my knee seems to wiggle open laterally when I flex my knee. They don't say that, but I think they they feel that it's natural because that's that's what the ligaments are used to feeling. Yeah, I think that certainly has um, something to do with um, early results after knee replacement, uh, whether or not you're do, you're doing mechanical or uh, kinematic alignment. If you're if you're too tight in both compartments. And even symmet if you're symmetrically too tight, it's an unnatural feeling knee to that patient, regardless of how you got there, most likely. Uh, you mentioned the valgus knee. I've noticed that the medial pivot design is a great knee for a valgus knee. Professor, why is that? What makes this knee so good for a valgus knee? So that's a great question, Laurie. Uh, we just published a paper in an international group with some of European colleagues looking, you know, how much we can push that envelope, right? And uh, in, in our series, that's my experience, it's not huge, but I have, you know, 20 years. Uh, so, so the way that we do it practically, in easy word, we, we like to, you know, I use a medial people design up to a Ranawa 2 uh, valgus alignment, let's say 20 degrees. And then again, it depends on the MCL, but I feel pretty comfortable uh, up to 20 degrees of uh, anatomical valgus. And then, uh, and then I think that for a no, type three, or in any case, like Bob say, there is a stretch MCL, we should increase the level of constraint. So to go to a, you know, a ultra congruent, a PS, a CPS, or even a, 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 a CCK, but it's, you know, it's a, every patient uh, is a different an anatomy. But, you know, right now, in, probably in, in, in 20, 30% of, of my valgus knees, I need a, a higher level of constraint than, than a medial pivot. Other than that, in probably 67%, I'm happy. Probably I'm a little bit more cautious, like you guys do probably with the bone cuts. I'm a little bit more conservative on both sides. <laughs> so, so I get stability there too, but that's, that's what I do. Uh, I don't know about you, but that's the way that I do every day when I have a bad knee. Totally agree, uh, totally agree. And I probably use um, the medial pivot design um, in 90% of my valgus knees. And, um, but like you, I'm very cautious with my bone cuts. I think the biggest mistake made in doing valgus knees it's the beginning of the case when you cut too much distal femur and then you end up chasing stability for the rest of the case, right? And I think it's a common a common mistake. And I assume that um, in your practices, you're still seeing lots of patients for instability that have come in from having other approaches and implants. So, you know, Bob? at Stanford, uh, so, sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. One second, because that's a very important question for me because you know, with Bill Maloney and Sir Goodman, we just published uh, 
uh, a paper on our cases, what we see at Stanford. And you know, in the in the first two years, let's say in a, you know uh, early early revisions, uh, we have uh, we have uh, infection first and instability second. But when we go to you know late revision, we have instability first and then infection and then stiffness. So this right. is our own experience. And you know, when I give the word to uh, Bob, sorry. I know, no, yes, perfect. No. Thank you. Yes, I, I had a patient one time, it was very interesting. I had done his father with a medial pivot knee, kinematic, and his, um, his father did very, very well. And he came in, he had had another uh, variety of implant seven years earlier, and he said, and then there was a revision of the poly, and then a third revision of the poly, and, and um, his knee just it wasn't as stable as it should be. And he was a younger gentleman because his father had had the knee too, but uh, so he came in and he said, can you do the same knee you did for my father? And I said, well, you know, you've had three surgeries and, and I can do, I can follow the concept and I can't really do kinematic because the revision systems aren't kinematic yet. But I said, I'm, I'm happy to do that and see if that works for you. And so I revised him to a medial pivot. He came in, the first post-op visit said, this is the best my knees felt in seven years and, and I've never seen them since. So... He just walked on out of there. It's great. Okay. No cane, no crutches, no walker. Great. So now so I have the is. tough. Now I have the tough question for each of you. Suppose you have a 63-year-old surgeon who's been doing knee replacements his whole career, mechanical alignment, using the medial pivot knee, has a practice that some um, has lots of happy patients, and. Um, a lot of patients, um, clearly 40% of my patients now at two weeks, I'm pretty well happy with how their progress since I see in a year, convinced me to change to KA. Who wants to go first for that one? Okay, I'll take it. Uh, All right. Uh, Laurie, so, so are you interested in gait analysis? I know you are, but uh, I yes. don't know how much you work and how, how many postdoc and PhD students you have. I'm sure you do. So this is the only difference that probably can push you with your experience. So if you look at gait analysis data, you see a difference. And I, I know that you know, <laughs> but uh, you have to follow those patients from, from that standpoint. So I'm lucky enough, again, I, as I told you, I trained with Tom Andriaki and, and now uh, you know, I'm on sabbatical in Italy and I have my own gait lab uh, in, in, in South Tyrol, which is a North part of Italy, and I'm seeing difference from a pure uh, gait analysis standpoint, and uh, you see a better kinematics. I, I call it closer to normal because it's not normal because we all know that when we remove the ACL, we the the, the normal kinematic uh, of the knee cannot be reproduced anymore. But again, with ki kinematic alignment, you can do it restricted and restricted the way that you like it. And a medial pivot knee, we are getting the closest to normal gait data that I ever saw in my life. And you know, I'm 56, I'm not uh, so young anymore. So this is the only thing that I'm pushing you. If you want to study, study in uh, your gait lab. Now there are there are instrumented uh, uh, treadmills, for example, not that expensive. You can study your patients there, and you're going to be satisfied. I don't know what Bob thinks about, but this is my experience. Well, I don't have all the, the research uh, resources, but uh, there's a number of articles that point out that the native knee, when you're standing, the joint is parallel to the ground. And when you do mechanical alignment, when you take an x-ray, when you're standing, the joint line is not parallel to the ground. But when you do kinematically aligned total knee replacement, then it's parallel to the ground again. So you're really mimicking the natural. And so I, I often wonder this question, if, uh, if the, when total knees first started, if we all got together and said, let's just put it where the joint is naturally, then let's imagine we're now in the present and we're saying, what about starting something called mechanical alignment? I think it'd be harder to move the dial off of kinematic alignment onto mechanical, then, you know, I think it's easier for us to move the, the needle from mechanical to kinematic, because I think there's a, there's an intuitive sense about it for me. And, and uh, mechanical alignment has served us well for years, and I did it for years. And, um, but 
I think if you look at, there's a couple studies I can forward to you where they show x-rays of standing people and you can, you know, I ask the audience sometimes, which knee would you rather have? And they all look at the one that's parallel to the ground. And so there, there you go. That's great. I appreciate the answers. And, you know, Bobby, bring up an interesting uh, point. Um, hey, we'd started there because we almost did, right? When our, and the original yeah. instrumentation um, from Hungerford and Krakow was a yeah. couple of degrees of varus on the tibia and valgus on the femur. Yeah. Yeah. But the yeah. different was difference was rotation. You talked about rotation earlier. And, uh, you know, I, I laugh at our peers sometimes when they actually, um, are planning mechanical alignment and they cut and see their x-rays and the tibias in a couple of degrees of varus and they said oh, i'll put this one in kinematic alignment i said no you didn't yeah. because your rotation is still based upon mechanical alignments yeah right, so right, um, right. we do certainly have a hodgepodge of techniques out there and it's um it is very difficult to measure what we do and um I, would you all agree that the advancements in technology if nothing else, are going to help us with our data collection so that we can actually compare techniques better. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, uh, as I told you before, uh, probably I was not approaching uh, the kinematic alignment principles and restricted kinematic alignment principles without a form of digital technologies. I think uh, that you know, navigations and robotics help us a, a lot to match exactly the the. the Preoperative planning, those cuts that need to be in 2.7 degrees of valgus on the on the femur or 2.3 degrees of valgus on the tibia. Uh, we need technology to do that, right? And and I think that's probably the right time because uh, you know the uh, robotic system and navigation systems is more user friendly. And uh, I had the chance to work with uh, Skywalker, and that's that's fantastic. is is a great system. So I don't know, Loris, if you already did that. But that's that's the benefit of new technologies. So when I hear that you know new technology are not that helpful, uh, probably uh, I think they are. The only problem maybe they slow you down a little bit uh, in your you know OR routine, right? Which is an issue in the U.S. I work on both sides of the ocean. It's more an issue in the U.S. than in Europe. You know, Europe we take it easier <laughs> in any <laughs> situation. Also in the OR, as you well know. But uh, but again. Uh, the technologies are helping us to match exactly your planning. You know, if you want to end out with a 2.7 degrees of virus uh, respect to HKA, you can do it with robotics or navigation. Yeah. And Bob, while you may not be using um, technology, I'm pretty sure you're recording everything you do so you know exactly where you put knees in so you can look back at your results and decide your results right, wrong, and how to make change in the yeah. future, right? Yeah, I think technology is, is certainly is coming. And I think um, when I first started this concept, it, it, it wasn't really adaptable to this. You know, I think the first robots were designed, I, I, the thought was that mechanical alignment is good, but the surgeons aren't reproducible. So if the, if the robotics could make this, the surgery reproducible, then that would be better. Well, the it did happen in the sense that they became more predictable, but the results weren't any better. So I, I think, you know, it's just that the, they were after the wrong target. They weren't going after, they were going after more precise mechanical alignment. And I think the fact that, that the advanced technologies didn't get better results showed that that wasn't the proper target. So now I think they're redirecting towards kinematic alignment or inverse kinematic alignment or functional alignment. A lot of these uh, words that I think sometimes get, get lost, the meaning gets lost because there's so many words floating out there. But I think that uh, my general philosophy is twofold. One is the more you can mimic the natural knee, probably the better for the majority of patients. Number two, I think technology is the tool in which you have to create your technique. So like Dr. Indelli, he's, he's got a tool, but he, he's got a technique. So he's using his technology to help with his technique. So I think the technique is the important thing. And then as technology advances and progresses, you know, you could, it, it no doubt will be more helpful. And I think that, um, you know, the KA results are usually given out as a, as just a, a composite when you realize, well, are the KA varus knees better than the KA valgus knees? You know, maybe that's the case, but we don't usually separate them out that way. But because 
mechanical alignment, there's one grouping of patients, whereas kinematic alignment, there's more of a spread of patients. So it'd be nice to have those results broken down more. And I certainly think that technology could help with that. Great. So, uh, Professor, when if a surgeon is switching from mechanical to kinematic, what tips do you give him or her? And what are the problems that you see when surgeons make that change? What what part of the case becomes the challenge for them? So, uh, you know, for example, uh, I, I will start with an easy, easy case, right? This is the best way to do it, right? So you start with a, you know, slight verus, slight vergus, and uh, maybe not a big flexion contraction, right? And you start with those cases and then follow those cases. And again, don't make my mistake to be too tight in, in flexion, for example, when I started. And, and uh, maybe have you know, somebody next to you, uh, more experienced surgeon for the first uh, few cases, but that's the way I, I would go, you know, with, with the easier, easier case and use technology. Because if, when you start something new, and, and you have, you know, a, a backup or a, you know, a, a friendly hand, I think that helps very much. So I, I strongly recommend, you know, do your preoperative planning based on a CT scan, redo your intraoperative planning using the same data and the new landmarks that you register intraoperatively. I think technology will help you to be more precise. So if somebody right now wants to start easy cases, use technology. Great. Thank you very much. Bob, he mentioned a tough case for a, a new KA surgeon. What about for an experienced KA surgeon? Do you have a patient with a 20, 25 degree flesh contracture? Is that a KA knee for you? And what do you do differently? Um, yes, it is. It, it's, a, it's actually more of a KA knee for me than a mechanical knee because those were cases. I actually have a higher comfort level doing kinematic cases uh, than I do doing them mechanically because mechanically I have to do all the the uh, recipes of ligament releases that are out there um, and the flexion contracture I used to say wow this is quite a flexion contracture I better take off some extra distal femur right off the bat well if I if my number one goal now as a kinematic alignment philosophy person is to preserve that joint line that's the last thing I would want to do and so what I found is most of the the flexion contractures usually have very large posterior osteophytes. And, and if I leave the joint line where it was pre-arthritis, if I make extra care to clean out those posterior osteophytes, a lot of times that will untension the posterior capsule and then that will allow them to fully extend. And, and oftentimes the, in extreme cases, there's often even osteophytes on the back of the tibia as well. So by the time you clear out those osteophytes, I think that gains you back almost all you need. Now, and let's say that it was still a little tight. Well, instead of taking two millimeters off the distal femur, I would take two millimeters off of the tibia because I want to preserve that, preserve that joint, preserve the flexion extension axis. That's my priority. So, um, so that's how right. I would handle a flexion contracture case. Wonderful. This has been an absolutely great discussion of both the medial pivot knee and alignment techniques from two experts. If the audience wants to get more of this, you have a great opportunity. Microport is, is sponsoring a course, the second annual Medial Pivot Society Global um, Meeting, and it is going to be in Phoenix in October. I'd encourage you to talk to your Microport reps because these are exactly the kind of discussions we'll be having there. We'll have lectures, but small group discussions where you can interact with the faculty and learn exactly what their thoughts are in a very personal way. So again, Thank you, Bob. Professor, great night tonight with great discussions, and I'm sure our audience will uh, really appreciate your um, expertise. Thank you very much.